Madame Ravens. This way to the library. She's been expecting you. Grove of the Unborn by Lynn Venable Tyndall heard the rockets begin to roar, and it seemed as though the very blood in his veins pulsated with the surging of those mighty jets. Going? They couldn't be going. Not yet. Not without him. And he heard the roaring rise to a mighty crescendo, and he felt the trembling of the ground beneath the room in which he lay, and then the great sound grew less and grew dim and finally dissipated in a thin hum that dwindled finally into silence. They were gone. Tyndall threw himself face down on his couch, the feel of the slick, strange fabric cold and unfriendly against his face. He lay there for a long time, not moving. Tyndall thought during those hours were of fundamental things that, Beneath him, beneath the structure of the building in which he was confined, lay a world that was not Earth, circling a sun that was not Sol, and that the ship had gone and would never come back. He was alone, abandoned. He thought of the ship, a silver streak now in the implacable blackness of space, threading its way homeward through the stars to Sol, to Earth. The utter desolation which swept over him at the impact of his aloneness was more than he could endure, and he forced himself to think of something else. Why was he here then? John Tyndall, third engineer of the starship Polaris. It had been such a routine trip, ferrying a group of zoologists and biologists around the galaxy, looking for unclassified life supporting planets. They had found such a world circling in an obscure sun halfway across the galaxy. An ideal world for research expeditions. Teeming with life, the scientists were delighted. In a few short months, they discovered and cataloged over a thousand varieties of flora and fauna peculiar to this planet, called Ariel, after the native name which sounded something like Ahirel. Yes, there were natives. Humanoid, civilized, and gracious, they had seemed to welcome the strangers. As a matter of fact, they seemed to expect them. The Aurelians had learned English easily, its basic sound not being too alien to their own tongue. They had quite a city there on the edge of the jungle, although encircling the planet before landing. The expedition had noted that this was the only city on a world only a little smaller than Earth. One city surrounded completely by the tropical jungle which covered the rest of the world. A city without power, without machinery of any kind, and yet a city that was self-sufficient. Well-tilled fields stretched to the very edge of the jungle where high walls kept out the voracious growth. The fields fed the city well and clothed it well. There were mines to yield up fine metal and precious gems. The earthmen had marveled, and yet it had seemed strange. On all this planet, just one city? With perhaps a half a million people within its walls? But this was not a problem for the expedition. The crew of the Polaris and the members of the expedition had spent many an enjoyable evening in the dining halls of the palace-like home of the Raal, who was something more than a mayor and something less than a king. Actually, Arel seemed to get along with a minimum of government. All in all, the Earthmen had summed up the Aurelians as being a naive, mild, and courteous people. They probably still thought so. All of them, that is. Except Tyndall. Of course, now that he looked back upon it, there had been a few things. The business about the bugs, as the Earthmen had dubbed the, the oddly ugly creatures who seemed to occupy something of the position of a sacred cow in the Aurelian 
scheme of things. The bugs came in all sizes, that is all sizes, from a foot or so in length up to the size of a full human. The bugs were not permitted to roam the streets and marketplaces like the sacred cows of earthly Hindus. The bugs were kept in a huge pens which none but a few high-ranking priests were permitted to enter and although the earthmen were not prevented from standing outside the pens and watching the ugly beast munch grass or basking in the sun, the Aurelians always seemed nervous when the strangers were about the pens. The earthmen had shrugged and reflected that religion was a complexity difficult enough at home, needless to probe too deep into the Aurelian. But the time had been something else again bringing with it the first sign of real Aurelian fanaticism and the first hint of violence. Tyndall and four companions were strolling in a downtown section of the city when all at once a hoarse cry in Aurelian shattered the quiet hum of the street activity. What did they say? asked one of Tyndall's companions, who had not learned much Aurelian. I think a time, a time. What could... He never finished the sentence. All about the Aurelians had prostrated themselves in the rather dirty streets, covering their faces with their hands, lying face down. The earthmen hesitated a moment, and a priest of Aurelia appeared as though from nowhere, a wicked scimitar-like weapon in his hand, and a face tense with anger. Dare you, he hissed in Aurelian. Dare you not hide your eyes at a time? He pushed one of the earthmen with surprising strength, and the latter stumbled to his knees. All five men hastened to the ape position of the prostrate Aurelian. They knew better than to risk sacrilege on a strange planet. As Tyndale sank to the ground and covered his eyes, he heard the priest mutter another sentence, in which his own name was included. He thought it was you, Time Doll. Even you. A few moments later, a bell sounded from somewhere, and the buzzing of conversation began around them, along with the shuffling, scraping sounds of many people getting to their feet at once. A hand touched Time Doll's shoulder, and an Aurelian voice, laughing now, purred, Up, stranger, up. The time is past. The Earthmen got to their feet. Everything about them was the same as though nothing had happened. People strolling along the streets, going in and out of shops, stopping to chat. I guess that was the all clear, commented one wryly. Another laughed nervously, but Tyndale was strangely troubled. He was thinking of the strange words of the priest. You, Tyndale? Even you? Why should he have known, and not the others? He tried to forget it. Aurelian was a complex tongue with confusing syntax. Perhaps the priest said something else, but Tyndale knew one thing for certain. The mention of his name had been unmistakable. The mood hung on, and quite suddenly Tyndale had asked, I wonder about the children. Why do you suppose it is? One of the men laughed. Maybe they feed him to the bugs. At no time during their stay on Aril had they seen a single child or young person under the age of about 21. The crew had speculated upon this at great length, coming to the conclusion that the youngsters were kept secluded for some reason known only to the Arillians. Probably some part of their religion. One of them made so bold as to ask of the scientists who politely told him that since his group was not composed of ethnologists or theologists, but of biologists and zoologists, they were interested neither in the Aurelians, their offspring, nor their religion, but merely in the flora and fauna of the planet, both of which seemed to be rather deadly. The expedition had had several close calls in the jungle. Some of the plants seemed as violently carnivorous as the animals. It was just a few days after the incident that the Aurelians kidnapped Tyndall. It had been a simple, old-fashioned sort of job, 
pulled off with efficiency and dispatch as he wandered a few hundred feet away from the ship. It was late and he had been unable to sleep, so he had strolled out for a smoke. The night watch must have been somewhere about on patrol, probably only a few hundred feet away on the other side of the ship. It happened suddenly and silently. The hand clapped over his mouth, the forearm constricting his windpipe. His legs jerked out from under him, and a rag smelling sickly sweet shoved under his nose, bringing oblivion. When he came to consciousness, he found himself in this room, and he knew that since then, many days and nights had passed. His wants were meticulously attended to, his bath prepared, his food brought to him regularly, delicious and steaming, with a generous supply of full-bodied Aurelian wine to wash it down. Fresh clothes were brought to him daily, the loose flowing, highly ornamented robe of the Aurelian noble. Tyndall knew he was no ordinary prisoner, and somehow this fact made him doubly uneasy. And then tonight, the ship blasted off without him. Tyndall could easily reconstruct what happened when his crewmates had inquired about him at the palace and in town. Tyndall? Then a sorrowful expression, a shrugging of shoulders, a pointing towards the death-infested jungle, and a mournful shaking of the head. Sign language, which in any tongue means... Tyndall wanders too far from your ship. He becomes lost. Alas, he does not know our jungle and its perils. Those who spoke a little English would make some expression of sympathy. Maybe the crew was a little suspicious. Maybe they thought there was something about the thing, and they thought of the unhappy results of what he was commonly referred to as interplanetary incident. Ever since the people of the second planet of Alpha Centauri, in an earlier days of extraterrestrial exploration, had massacred an entire expedition because the captain had mortally insulted the tribal leader by refusing a sacred fruit, such incidents had been avoided at all cost. And so they dared not offend the Aurelians by questioning the veracity of their statements. And the jungle was deadly. So they looked a little longer and asked a few more questions. After a while, the scientists had completed their work and were anxious to get home. So the ship blasted off without him. All this had passed kaleidoscopically in Tyndall's mind as, as he lay on the couch in his luxurious prison, too numb to weep or even curse. His reverie was broken by the clicking of the lock, and he raised up to see the door opening. An Aurelian servant stood there, his silver hair done up in the complicated style, which denoted male house servants. He was unarmed. The houseman smiled, roared in imitation of a rocket, made a swooping gesture with one hand to indicate the departing ship, and then pointed at Tyndall and the open door. The servant bowed and departed, leaving the door slightly ajar. Now that the ship was gone, he was free to leave his room. Tyndall stepped cautiously out of the room and found himself in a long hall with many doors opening from it on either side much like a hotel corridor. One end of the hall seemed open, out onto a garden, and he started in that direction. The doorway opened out into a patio which overlooked a vast and perfectly tended garden. The verdant perfection of the scene was marred only by one of the bugs, sunning itself and gnawing on the stem of a flower. Steindahl was impressed again with the repulsive ugliness of the thing. This one was of the size of a small adult human, and even vaguely human in outline, although the brownish armored body was still more suggestive of a big bug than anything else known to him. There were even rudimentary wings, 
furled close to the curving back, and the underside was dirty, striped gray. Tyndall shuddered, wondering why the Aurelians, who so loved to surround themselves with beauty, should choose so horrendous a creature as the object of their worship or protection. He heard running footsteps behind him and turned to see the Aurelian houseman, breathless, with an expression of greatest concern on his face. The servant bowed respectively before Tyndall, then gestured at the garden, shook his head vigorously from side to side, and tugged at the earthman's sleeve. Forbidden territory, eh? Okay, old fellow, what now? The servant motioned for Tyndale to follow him and ushered him down the hall from whence he had just come and into another of the rooms opening off from it. The very old man reclining upon the low, Roman-like couch, Tyndale recognized as one as his host, the Rall of Aril. The Rall touched the fingertips of both hands to his forehead in the Aurelian gesture of greeting, and Tyndall did the same. He noticed several male Aurelians standing near the back of the room, although the servant had bowed and retired. Well, Tyndall, how do you enjoy the hospitality of Ariel? He, of course, gave the native pronunciation to the name, which was almost Teutonic in its sound, and unpronounceable for Tyndale because of the sound given to the double aspirate for which he knew no equivalent. Your English, Depral, has improved greatly since our last meeting, commented Tyndale guardedly, using the Aurelian prefect of extreme respect. The old man smiled. Your friends were kind enough to lend me books and also the little grooved discs that make voice. He gestured towards an old-fashioned wind-up type phonograph, which Tyndale recognized at once as being standard aboard interstellar ve vehicles, and for just such a purpose. The Rall continued, For teaching English, very fine. How are you enjoying our hospitality? I ask again. Tyndale was struck on a reel, and he knew it. There was no need to cook his own goose by being deliberately offensive. I appreciate the hospitality of a reel. I express my thanks for the consideration of my hosts, but if I may ask a question. Yes? What, in the wisdom of Deb Rall, is the reason for my, uh, detainment? To answer that, Time Dal, I must tell you something of the past of Ariel and her destiny. All these words, the other Aurelians in the room drew closer, and Rall motioned them to a couch at his feet and nodded towards Tyndale, Requesting that he join them, Tyndall noticed that the others were gazing up into the old man's face with an expression of raptness, even of reverence. He knew that the Rowl did not possess an especially exalted position politically, even though he was the head of the city. He guessed, therefore, that the Rowl must be the religious ruler of Ariel as well. The Rowl began intoning the words as though he was reciting a ritual. There was a time, many thousands of creels ago, when the kingdom of Aril was not one small city, as you see it now, but a mighty empire girding the world in her fastness. But the people of Aril had become evil in their way and her cities were black with sin. It was then that Zave himself left his kingdom in paradise and appeared to the people of Ariel, and he told them that he was displeased and that bad times would fall upon Ariel, and that her people would dwindle in number 
and became exceedingly few, and the jungle would reclaim her empty cities. One city, and only one, would survive and prosper, and the people of that city would be given the chance to redeem a real and remove the heavy hand of Zeev's terrible punishment. All this came to pass, and in the dark, Creelus, that followed, all of Ariel vanished except this city. Now, for many, many thousands of Creelus, the people of this city have striven to redeem Ariel by obeying the sacred laws of Zeev. Zeev had promised that when the punishment was ended, he would send a sign. And his sign would be that a great silver shell should fall from the heavens, and within would be Zeev's own emissary, who must wed the ranking priestess of Zeev, establishing again the rapport between the kingdom of paradise and the world of Ariel. When Rahl had finished, the other Aurelians in the room fastened the same look of reverence upon Tyndall, which they had formerly reserved for the Rahl. Tyndall chose his words carefully. Uh, but there were many aboard my vessel. Why did you, de Bral, select me as the emissary of Zeev? Zeev selected you. I recognized you. As all of your companions, you and you alone have the sun-colored hair, which is the sacred color of Zeev. Tyndall was able to question Rall almost coolly. The trap was already sprung. The ship was gone. Now he only wanted to know the how and the why. An accident of pigmentation. Only that had brought him to this sun-colored hair. But, Debral, did my friends and I not often tell you of ourselves, of the place in which we came? A world, a world like your own. The old man smiled. Do not think me naive, Tyndall. I am quite aware that you are but a man, a man from another world. Although quite an incredible world it must be, I know also that you were, until this hour, unaware of your destiny. I knew that when my priest reported that you ignored the ritual of the time, until literally forced to obey, that is why we had to use devious means to make certain that your companions would not prevent the fulfillment of the prophecy. Now, of course, you understand. I do not think the priestess, Lyrisa, will make you unhappy, Tyndall. This was not Earth, and these people were not Earthmen. The thought now did not bring the bitter pain it had at first, right after the ship left. Earth already was becoming hazy in Tyndall's mind. A lovely globe of green somewhere, somewhere far, and home once a lifetime ago. No, the Aurelians were not Earthmen, but they were human and an attractive, gracious race. Life would not be bad among the Aurelians, especially as the espoused of the ranking priestess of Aurel. Tyndall figured the rich material of his Aurelian robe. He thought of the food, the wine, the servants. No, he decided. Not bad at all. One thing, though, this priestess, Lyrisa. I have, then, but one request to make, Debral. I would like to see the priestess, Lyrisa. The old man almost chuckled. That is understandable, Tyndall, but it is not yet the time. Tyndall, reveling in the strength of his position, grew bolder. I would like very much, Debral, to see her now. Debral's face darkened. Very well, Tyndall, but I warn you, 
Do not enter the grove. There is death there, death that even I am powerless to prevent. The guardians will not harm her, but any stranger will not live many minutes in the grove. I will not enter Debral. Tyndall, the time is very soon, possibly this hour. Will you not wait? I prefer not to wait, Debral. The Rall gestured to a young Aurelian. Beal, show Tyndall to the grove of the priestess, Lyrisa. The younger man protested. But Debral, so near the time, what if... Do as I command, snapped Rall. Beal turned silently, motioning for Tyndall to follow. The young Aurelian led Tyndall the length of the corridor back to the patio he had stepped onto by mistake earlier in the day. Beale stepped respectfully aside. Heindal looked out into the garden. The sun was beginning to set. The long shadows stretched across the dim recesses of tropical greenery. The huge insect-like thing was still there, stretched out in a narrow strip of sunlight, catching the last falling waves of warmth from the sinking sun. Tyndale turned to the Aurelian. Where might I find the priestess, Lyrisa? he asked. There, Deb Tyndale. I s see no one. O where did you say? Beale pointed. There, Deb Tyndale, where I point. You see the priestess, Lyrisa, taking the afternoon sun. Unless your eyesight is exceedingly bad, Deb Tyndale. You cannot fail to see. Tyndale's eyesight was exceedingly good. He followed the pointing figure, past the pillar that supported the roof of the patio, past the first row of alien green plants, past the second and third row to a clearing, a little patch of sunlight, to the thing lying there, the monstrous, misshapen bug. The bug, the priestess, Larissa. Tyndale felt a pounding, skull-shattering madness closing in on him. This was a joke, of course. No, no joke. A dream, then. No, not that either. In only a few split seconds, it happened. Tyndale had leapt the rail around the patio and was streaking through the grove, heading for its outer boundary, the city. If he could get out of the grove, there would be places to hide in the city, Narrow streets, empty cellars, dim, dim alleys. They'd never find him there. Run now, run before he was overtaken. But he was not being pursued. Beale stood on the patio, transfixed with horror. He heard the Aurelian terrified cry of, Deb Tyndall! And then a rope shot out and grabbed him by the ankles. Not a rope, really. A green something. There were others around his arms, his chest, his hips, wrapping him in their sticky green embrace. The guardians. He tried to cry it out, but one of the verdant fronds enveloped his throat so tightly he could not utter a sound. The innocent green things of the grove were vigilant guardians indeed. They seemed to be merely holding him immobile. But Tyndall realized with a sick horror that their pressure was increasing. So little at a time, but so steadily. And something was happening out there in the sunlight, too. The creature had convulsively grasped the branch of a bush and was clinging weakly to it, great tremors racking her body. It seemed to be struggling, suffering, dying, even as he was. In his agony, Tyndall laughed. A time! A time! The voice came from the patio. Tyndall saw Beale throw himself face down on the floor, covering his eyes with his hand. He heard the cry echoed within the palace, and then, like a mighty roar outside the city, and then there was silence. Silence broken only by the sound of his own breathing as he dragged his tortured lungs across his shattered ribs. He saw the bug give a great heave, and then it seemed to split open. 
the entire skin splitting in a dozen places, and a hand, a hand reached from within that dying hulk and grasped the bush to which it clung. A white, slender hand on a fragile wrist, and then the arm was free. A woman's arm, a beautiful arm. Tyndall began dimly and too late to understand. A leg kicked free, a slender ankle, the ample flesh thigh. Tyndall clung to consciousness doggedly. The guardian was crushing the last dregs of life out of him, and even the pain seemed to recede. His mind was very, very clear. So that was it. A word once heard in a long-forgotten classroom and then the scientists of the expedition. Metamorphosis. He had meant to ask them what, but he remembered now what it meant. A passing from one form to another. Had he failed the biology test once because he didn't know what metamorphosis meant? Dimly, dimly, he saw. The last thing Tyndale ever saw was the priestess, Larissa, as she stepped out of the empty hulk, kicking it away with a disdainful toe. Breathless from her ordeal, she sank to the grass, her breasts heavy with exhaustion. <laughs> she sat there for a few minutes in the sunlight, then tossed her head and spread her long raven hair out on her shoulders the better to dry in the warming sun. So quoth this raven. This was, again, uh, an older <laughs> sci-fi story from one of those wonderful pulp fictions. It's from 1957. I hope you enjoyed it, my darlings. Have a wonderful, wonderful day. Thank you so kindly for stopping by my chateau, my darlings. It does mean so much to me. Please, if you have not subscribed, as many of you have not, please do so. Give me a like so I know what you would like to hear. And comment. I always love to read your comments. And special thanks to my Patreon and membership supporters. Ciao, darlings.